I'm a development worker, and usually when I'm standing in front of a room full of people like this, I'm telling stories about how wonderful my work is, and I'm trying to convince people to support it and get behind it. Well, either that or I'm singing karaoke, but <laughs> fortunately for you, that's not the case today. But seriously, I think there are some problems in the development sector with talking about success all of the time. We can start to believe our own hype, and we can present ideas about our work that's just not realistic. I think it's important and also much more interesting to talk about failures and what they can teach us. So I'm going to talk about a couple of my own failures and what they taught me, and how I think that it's important in development work to own up to our failures in order to improve our work. So I love planning new projects. I get really excited. We, I go and research the issues uh, with our team. We build a case for our idea, and we examine all the factors that are causing the problems. We, we use our experience from the field, and we consult the people that we're working with. And then we put, put together a, a proposal. We, we present it to our donors and our partners. And if we're lucky, they get behind us, and away we go. So we arrive in a village or a community or, or a country, depending on the scale we're working at, and with all, this, all these great ideas and all this knowledge behind us, we can't help but succeed, right? Not really. I probably don't have to tell you that development projects fail all of the time. And they've been failing since the first, Europe, the first European missionaries arrived in Africa to save everyone's souls. And they continue failing today. So at the highest level, it's estimated that 76% of World Bank health projects, projects in Africa fail. And that's just one example amongst hundreds. It's clear that a huge amount of resources, billions of dollars in fact, is going to things that don't work. And the biggest problem is that we're not hearing a lot about why. I think failing is a good and necessary thing. To quote a contemporary thinker, wisdom comes from experience, and experience comes from making mistakes. Now, I know that sounds like Confucius, but it's actually Master Splinter from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> and if, if you ask my son, he's the most influential thinker in the world right now. But if Master Splinter is right, and wisdom comes from making mistakes, I must be incredibly wise. Because I've made a lot of mistakes in my work, and I've seen my share of projects fail, at least the first time around. I always find it interesting to listen to other development professionals tell their stories of failed projects. And there are really two kinds of people in this context. There are those who begin their stories with I or we, and there are those who begin their descriptions with they. And I most admire the people who begin their stories with I. I thought it would be a great idea to start a frog farm in Mariental, but then I discovered that Dhamra people don't really like to eat frogs, and after two months, our project went broke. <laughs> or I didn't do enough research on gender perceptions of pink condoms in the Zambezi region, and no one wanted to wear them. <clears throat> this kind of response, this kind of response is great. It shows that people have thought a lot about the problems, They've internalized them, and hopefully they won't repeat them. And there's a good chance that they'll go on to do something better next time, better and more successful. But I meet a lot of development workers who begin their stories with they. They say things like, the people selling the frogs in Mariental were not able to give good customer service because it's just not part of their culture. And that caused the project to go bankrupt or they didn't do adequate marketing of the pink condoms in the Zambezi region, and that's why no one wanted to go near them. It's difficult to understand, of course, the way people think when they come from a completely different socioeconomic background to us. But without the ability to at least contemplate where people are coming from, we have absolutely zero chance of being able to work with them. People who begin their descriptions of project failures with they, they haven't taken personal responsibility for what went wrong and they're less likely to learn from their experiences. I'll give you an example now of how I, failed to one, how I failed to understand one group's perspective and what I learned from it. 
So if you've ever driven down Tull Street in Wintook late at night on a weekend, you'll have noticed that there are women standing around, waiting on the darker street corners, trying to entice men who are driving by to stop and chat. It doesn't look so different from red light districts in other parts of the world. And you might not have thought much about the lives of these women, beyond wondering why they've chosen to do what can be an incredibly dangerous an unpleasant job, where prostitution is criminalized and HIV prevalence is amongst the highest in the world here in Namibia. Whatever else they're experiencing through their work, Windhoek's prostitutes are learning a, a unique approach to business. They face persecution from police, aggressive behavior from their clients, and they, they have a very unstable income. They risk their lives to support their families. So they have to be incredibly tough to survive out there. Several years ago, I began a discussion with an organization that supports women who want to leave commercial sex work and find other employment. We decided that helping a group of women to manage their own bicycle shop could be a great opportunity. And the women from the program were really enthusiastic. So then we presented the idea to our donors and our partners, and they came on board. And not long afterwards, we trained a group of women, five women, in bicycle mechanics and business skills, and they began selling bikes. Perfect, right? <laughs> but within a few months, things had gone very wrong. Our partner organization <coughs> had discovered that the women had sold most of the starting stock of their bicycles, and they'd run very little of the money through the books. It was terrible news, and my reaction was to feel really angry and disappointed with the women involved. How could they do this to my wonderful project? I, couldn't, I just couldn't fathom how short-sighted they were being. But were these women lacking in vision? Were they culturally incapable of managing a business, of running a bike shop? Were they just plain bad? No. In, in fact, these were some of the funniest, most articulate and clever people I've ever worked with. They did really well in the training, and they made me laugh all the time. They were hilarious. But what I failed to do was to fully appreciate where they were coming from, their motives, and how these had been formed. Of course, I can't know what it's like to be a commercial sex worker in such a tough environment. But only after the project failed the first time around did I really try to put myself in their shoes. And I realized that relearning conventional business skills would take a lot of, was a long-term prospect and would take a lot of relearning and rethinking. So restarting the project with a different approach was far more successful. Together with our partner organization, we saw that we hadn't done enough to change the entrenched ways of thinking about business that were, were reinforced when the women worked together as a group. We felt we had to have, have the women work alongside people with different experiences in order to reinforce the kind of ideas that we were talking about in our training. And we had to restart really slowly too because we'd lost most of our working capital. Now, of course, it's, it's really tough to admit that you're wrong to yourself, to your staff, your partners, your donors, and to your family. Your ego doesn't like this kind of exposure. And it's very uncomfortable to be wrong. It's very uncomfortable to be here talking about how wrong I am, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important for a leader to show those around them that owning your failures is a sign of responsibility and not of weakness. So I'm glad to say that in the case of the rebooted bicycle shop, it's still running today, six years later, and it's making profits that support women out of commercial sex work and into mainstream employment. <clears throat> but this was only possible after a, a really thorough and honest assessment of what I got wrong the first time around. I find that in my work, of all the things that I've ever done in Namibia in the past 10 years, the, the one project that's the most instantly spellbinding and attention-grabbing is our bicycle ambulance project. If I just mention the words bicycle and ambulance together in one sentence, normally people, their jaws drop and their eyes open and, and they can't help but be interested. So what the hell is a bicycle ambulance? Well, as you can see, it's, it's basically a stretcher on wheels 
that can be pulled by an ordinary bicycle. And in rural, rural Namibia, where most people lack access to any kind of motorized transport, getting a sick person to a medical facility can be a major challenge. And we began building our bicycle ambulances in response to HIV and AIDS outreach volunteers who we had given bicycles to. They told us that when they visited their clients, they were sometimes called upon to transport them on the luggage racks of their bicycles to the nearest hospital or clinic. And clearly, that's not a desirable situation. So through a long process, I contracted a wonderful designer and he designed, tested, and developed, together with our healthcare organization partners and the volunteers, this beautiful, beautiful bomb-proof ambulance for use in the Namibian bush. So we were all very happy with ourselves after months of testing and evolving the design. And even during prototyping, people's lives were being saved. People who faced enormous difficulties getting to medical facilities were now able to call their local healthcare volunteer and arrive in relative comfort. From malaria to scorpion bites to childbirth, our ambulances could really make a difference. So I felt that the technology was the hard part, and now that we developed it, everyone would leap at the chance to have a bicycle ambulance in their village. And in fact, the ambulances were very well received. They're quite unusual, as you can see, and when they, when they arrive in a Namibian village, they have a big impact, and word gets out that you can call on them should you need one in a medical emergency. We built and delivered more than 100 bicycle ambulances built here in our workshop in Namibia. We found that the majority were used frequently in the first months after they were delivered, and they did what they were supposed to do. But over time, we would drop in to visit ambulances that had been in the field for longer, only to find them locked up in broom closets in clinics with flat tires and the bicycles to pull them long gone. This was clearly not the result we'd been hoping for and not a long-term solution to the problem of medical transport in rural Namibia. So what had gone wrong? After all, we designed this wonderful vehicle that could be repaired locally, could be pulled fairly easily through thick sand, and was a far quicker and more comfortable solution to what was being used in villages, things like wheelbarrows. The majority of the, the patient feedback, the operator feedback, was overwhelmingly positive. So why weren't they being used? Once again, I felt frustrated, and the, but the problem was not with the healthcare volunteers who had been tasked with managing the ambulances, or the healthcare professionals in the clinics and hospitals who had been tasked with coordinating their use. It was actually my whole approach to the question of how people get to hospitals and clinics. I'd become so convinced that the value of our bicycle ambulances would be obvious to everyone and that the management systems required to maintain them would easily be taken care of by the local communities where they were delivered. With each bicycle ambulance, we led some discussions about management, about collecting maintenance fees from the communities, and then we left each community to manage its own ambulance. But I'd ignored some fundamental issues. For one thing, I hadn't thought about my own attitude to emergency medical transport. And when I was younger and lived in Melbourne, in Australia, where I grew up, I had the option of paying an annual ambulance insurance, a very small amount each year to cover the cost of any trip that I might need to take in an ambulance. But like most people in reasonable health, I never imagined that I would actually need to take a ride in an ambulance, so I never paid into this fund. But here I was, many years later, expecting subsistence farmers in Namibian villages to pay into an ambulance maintenance fund, people with far less resources than I had had when I was young. Of course, just like in Melbourne, very few people were willing to contribute to something that they hoped they would never need. The healthcare volunteers then had, had no money to maintain the ambulances, and we lacked the funds to continue supporting their maintenance because we hadn't planned for it. And as a result, sadly, a lot of our ambulances are not in regular use today. There's another question with this project that I forgot to ask at the beginning, and that is, how do most people in the world actually get to hospital? I went looking for data, and I learned that the majority of people admitted to hospitals the world over actually arrive in vehicles other than ambulances. They'll get on the train, they'll take a bus, they'll call a taxi, they'll go in a private car. 
So once again, I'd been blinded by the idea of this wonderful technological solution, and I'd ignored how the real world normally functions. What I now believe could be a better approach is to create a bicycle trailer that could do a lot of really useful things like carrying water, carrying grain, carrying firewood, carrying goats, whatever. The kind of things we do with cars and taxis and delivery services. And because of the economic incentives, these bicycle trailers would have a much better likelihood of being maintained. So we did make a few such trailers, designed once again by, by our wonderful designer. And the evidence suggests that they are being much better maintained than our ambulances were. So this is great news for me. This is the happy end of a sad story. There's another project for me to do in the future. So I've talked about a couple of my professional failures today, with a bicycle shop run by former sex workers and a bicycle ambulance project. Now, obviously, these have a, a very particular focus, and you're probably wondering how these failures relate to your work. But I think the basis of my mistakes is quite common. And firstly, there's a failure to understand where people are coming from and how to adapt to their approach. And secondly, an arrogance about our proposed solutions that can make us blind to what's actually needed. I hope it might encourage other people who work for NGOs, and for that matter, who work in the private sector, who work for government, to start talking more openly about their mistakes and their failures, and hopefully to learn from them and try and get to the roots of why things don't work. As uncomfortable as it is, we need to own our mistakes in order to move forward, and we need to learn from each other about what's not working. And indeed, I think that failures can become ideas that are worth spreading. Thank you.